Hello, and welcome to the joint ISC Squared and ASIS International press release at the inaugural ISC Squared Security Congress, co-located with the ASIS International 57th Annual Seminar and Exhibits. We've gathered here today, sounds like a wedding, doesn't it, to discuss why these two leading organisations have come together to host the industry's largest security event, with over 20,000 security professionals from 90 countries in attendance. They've created a first-of-its-kind event where physical and information security disciplines come together to benefit the greater security community. As many of you know, there's been a long talk about the convergence of information and physical security. But in most organisations, especially in the US government, physical security and information security have maintained an exclusive existence. However, many corporate executives see both physical and information security as an integral part of risk management and see no reason not to combine the two. Information technology, as you know, is intricately involved in many physical security tasks, smoke and fire detection, human resource privacy data, access control with biometrics, alarms, information transfer and storage. And the list goes on, financial, compliance data, other communications, these types of electronic security systems require complex information technology infrastructure and configuration that must be performed by a knowledgeable IT person. So there's no argument about the need for an IT department to support it with the many aspects of security projects and operations. Given today's threats, particularly data breaches, organisations need to take holistic enterprise-wide approach to security involving all of the disciplines and stakeholders. Recent reports indicate that about only one third of organisations are actively sharing responsibilities between traditional security and information security departments to improve both areas. With only 30% actively converging, it's safe to say that enterprise security strategy is still much a work in progress. This event is truly a game changer to bring the best of both worlds together. And so with that, I'm pleased to invite Ray O'Hara to the podium to introduce ASIS and discuss why this holistic approach is so critical. Ray. Well, thank you, Shane. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. We're very excited about the relationship that we've developed with ISC Squared over the past year. And uh, Horton and I were just talking momentarily, indicating how happy we were that this was coming together the way it was. And you know, we think we have a roadmap for the future here, not just for the organizations, but more importantly, for the members of the organizations and the potential members of both organizations around the world. So the uh, little snapshot of ASIS, uh, Shane mentioned some of it, uh, 37,000 members around the world. Uh, about 20% outside of the United States, a little over 200 chapters around the world. Our, our international base is growing uh, a little bit more rapidly than our national base. And uh, we're continuing to expand internationally uh, with, uh, with the events that we hold the year we do. This is our largest seminar and exhibits uh, that occurs about this time every year. And as Shane mentioned, we have about 20,000 security people here for that. 700 exhibitors on the floor. Uh, we also hold events in Europe, uh, the Middle East, and the Far East and Asia uh, throughout the year. There's much smaller events, but they follow the similar theme that we have here today with exhibits and educational sessions and uh, networking events. So about five years ago or so, maybe a little bit longer, uh, we realized that ASIS being the traditional security practitioners, um, or the guns, gates, and guards, as I like to say, uh, really needed to educate our members more on the emerging cyber threats and the other opportunities from technology that we present ourselves with every day. And as you know, as you sit here, uh, globalization is surrounding us. Uh, virtualization is also surrounding us, no matter which side of the fence you're on. And uh, today's employee wants to do everything uh, that they can do wherever they happen to be at any time of the day or night in whatever country that is in the world. 
so that globalization and virtualization is really affecting us from the standpoint of we have to deliver services and education to our members so that they're better prepared to deal with the challenges that are happening today and the challenges that are coming tomorrow that we don't know about. And uh, we've been looking at some statistical information that we have about cyber threats and uh, how high on the totem pole are they of a concern to the security professional. And uh, we, we think that at the end of the day, the cyber threats are probably at the top of this totem pole for both sides of the house. So certainly on the ISC squared side, probably a little bit more than the traditional side, but the traditional side is catching up and learning about this a little quicker. Hopefully our pace will quicken a little bit as well as we realize that the uh, fences are still important in, uh, in the corporations that we work for, but they're not as important that they use, as they used to be. So we're not as worried about somebody coming over the fence like we used to be and uh, had all the cameras and the lights and the action and all of that because today what coming over the fence for isn't as important as what coming over the internet uh, in any form that it comes at us. So that uh, gives me a chance to turn it over to Horde for a moment and uh, have him fill us in on ISC squared. Thank you. First off, I wanted to thank uh, Ray and Michael and everyone else over the past year who helped us all make this happen. I mean, we get to take the, a lot of the credit for it, but we had, we had a lot of folks that, um, as bureaucracies, you know, we're kind of mini bureaucracies of ourselves, iron out a lot of details between um, the two different structures that we, that, that we have. And I was, I was asked, uh, earlier, why haven't y'all done this sooner, you know? And I recant tales back of my experiences in the uh, Department of Interior, whereas um, the, the uh, traditional security was on one side of the building reporting to uh, one side of the structure, and I'm over on the other building as CIO reporting up to another one. And we would see each other in staff meetings, and, uh, and that was about it. Um, everyone seems to seem to have been comfortable in their roles at that time and working in those type of silos uh, may have been all okay at the time. But uh, coming into ISC squared after retiring from the government in 2007, um, I really liked the holistic approach to, um, to security, particularly from the logical. And, and that thought has always lingered with me is, Okay, that works. That works within the IT community itself. It works within the business community. It also needs to work within the traditional security. Security, security, security. And I also have extended that to the privacy piece as well. And in my world, I often found it difficult to separate where privacy began and where security came in or ended. They're really blended and inter integrated as, as well. So we both recognize from both sides of our organizations that we can actually make two and two equal five here. If we just put some synergy to this, and if we use our 80,000 members, we use our reputation as the uh, highest respected IT security organization out there compared with uh, ASIS on equal credentials and, and reputation and respect on their side, We'll have over 100,000 members to start with. That's a tremendous base. And we, we will have, we'll, we'll, we can make some differences. We can make some, some influences in doing that. Um, collaboration, in my opinion, is where things have to change in, in the world of security. We're, we're, we continue to fall further and further behind and it, it seems like uh, we, we, we're constantly struggling to find, find the answers. We need to find the answers together. So we, we talk to anyone who's willing to listen to share our passion in making things better and contributing to that security, that security space. Um, I, I, the, the story this morning at, at the uh, commemorative kind of rang a bell back with me and reminded me of, of, uh, of the pain that uh, I experienced in another job within, within the government, whereas it was over, uh, I actually had the physical security, the law enforcement, and the, uh, the IT piece. And my mission was to get 
people to where they could communicate on a radio together. And this was brought up as a major problem in the 9-11 incident. And I was around the late 1900s, uh, late 1999s, uh, early 2000s, that there was a press to reduce um, the, uh, the need for spectrum by going from analog to digital. And you'd be amazed at how people resisted that change because it meant they had to buy new radios. <laughs> and the radios were very expensive, particularly the digital radios. And uh, part of Interior ran uh, an emergency center in Boise, Idaho, that depended on these uh, state, local communities, firefighters, wildland fighters, all of that. We all depended upon good communication, good solid radios that worked. And we had to get the spectrum down, we had to modernize. Um, one of the things that we did was to offer that technology to firefighting institutions uh, around the world, for that matter, Australia. Uh, comes to mind, Mexico, Canada. And one of the breakdowns in that 9-11 that just will never uh, leave my mind was we had digital radios um, in place in, in, the, in that area, in New York. But somewhere along the line, communication failed on training one of the branches on how to use the radios. And the digital radios are not really usable friendly at that time. And a number of the units gave up on them and went back and got their analogs. So you had analogs trying to talk to digitals and the uh, revert back switches not working here, there, and there. It, short, in short, it led to mass confusion. So that to me, again, was where physical and logical <laughs> security could have gotten together and worked this out in a, in a, in a smoother fashion, if you will. Um, so we, we continue to struggle with things like that. And uh, I remain an optimist. The cup is always half full with me. And uh, we'll continue to have problems. We're not, I'm also not naive. <laughs> and uh, I look at yesterday as a, uh, as a memory and tomorrow as a dream and a vision, and today as a gift. And that's why we call it the present. So we're looking forward to, to moving forward uh, with this partnership, and there's many things we can do together collaboratively. We both have events all over the world, and it's time for us to start sharing resources and talking on the same song sheet. So thank you once again, gentlemen and ladies, for the opportunity to work with you. It's been uh, uh, a, a sensational inauguration for our first Congress. Thank you. Thanks, Horde. Thanks, Ray. So as we begin to think about opening our q and I'd like to introduce to you another one of our distinguished panelists, and that's Maureen Allison. Maureen is the CISO for Johnson & Johnson. Uh, again, one of the few people in the room we were talking just before with experience in both physical and information security and those kinds of insights. I think it's great as we speak about and we really acknowledge the fact that there is mutual recognition that we are partners in the same security ecosystem. So as we get going now, what I'd like to do is to open this up uh, for some comments. Uh, Ray, would you like to perhaps uh, help by... Uh, starting uh, the conversation off, and we'll take some questions, please, from the floor. Okay, meet just here, sir. Um, can you give us some examples of where physical and biological security seem to come together? Talk about the 30% of the physical and biological security seem to come together. Talk about the 30% that's just beginning to happen. Where, where's a logical Maureen, maybe that you'd like to take that. Oh, this is my forte. This one is a great one. Um, where you find this is where both departments, no matter who they report to, will start working together is around an investigation. 
whether if you have someone who intrudes into a network or has stolen some data from a company, the first thing you have to do is, is you're going to have the uh, physical security folks who typically run your investigative department, and they have the relationship because in a lot of instances they work for the attorneys in the company. Uh, so they will have a great investigative skills, and usually they will have the relationship with law enforcement. So they're going to look, and then they work. They they call up their partner in IT security and say, "Hey, I think somebody's intruded on this network. Can you help me?" And what happens is, is then from the IT security side of it, work with the folks in the IT systems, as well as if a company has um, computer forensic tools, and that's where they work together. That's where they come together. And as they come together, they find that they have things like case management software around um, the investigations that they do. Uh, the uh, physical security folks typically have some pretty slick uh, uh, companies and software that they use. And the IT folks are usually using uh, uh, Excel spreadsheets and, and aren't sophisticated in this space. When they come together, they find out, well, wait a minute. The one that's used for physical security can also be used for IT security. And then all of a sudden, they each have access to the security incidents that are occurring in the company. And what happens, that, that ends up becomes the driving force. Uh, and and uh, working together and solving a case becomes the partnership and the success story, and then from there it blossoms. Um, in the companies that I've been in, yes, absolutely. Um, and what has happened is, is once you see the training and you see how close they are and the messages are so close, and with the, um, uh, the focus on budgets, uh, what happens is if I spend, if you have two budgets and there is and an amount, ten, $10 and $10, right? So you get $20 to spend. If you have to, if you each spend $7 on the same message, you are spending $14 and you're not, getting your, you're not getting the other message out. When you come together, you're able to capitalize on the message and put it out. Um, then all your costs, then it, it, it's a cost factor, and you drive together to get a stronger message out. In my corporation, Johnson & Johnson, uh, we're working on right now with the physical security department uh, on a message around malware, around um, uh, securing your computer, which websites you go to. Why? Because it is a common security risk, and together, by combining our message and by combining our uh, communication and awareness dollars, we do twice the message. So, and that's where, that's where it'll come, is, is you can actually combine. Now, um, you, have to, um, you, know, you have to be willing to work and understand that sometimes you speak different languages, and once you learn the common language and you can come together, uh, then you, then you uh, actually exponentially uh, support yourselves. So. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Murray. Uh, a great question. I think that really does play into this idea that we're learning from each other and that it's a process of collaboration and partnership within what we talked about as that wider security ecosystem. So as we get the conversation going now, maybe we can perhaps focus on discussing how the industry will benefit from collaboration and what to expect in the future. And uh, Ray, perhaps in your role as Executive Vice President of uh, International Service and consulting and investigations at Andrews. What are you seeing? Is this an international thing? Have you got some thoughts and comments around that? Thank you. I do, actually, as Maureen was speaking. You know, if you just take simple uh, onboarding, credentialing, access to rooms, access to buildings, uh, in the old days, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we'd build the fences higher as if we got worried about it. We'd put more barbed wire on the fences just to keep the people out. 
today the intent is to make people more productive in their workspace around the world. And as I mentioned earlier about globalization uh, and uh, the way people want to work today, you know, if, you, if you're working very closely with your IT security folks and your physical security folks, you can take the fences down because the inner barriers, multiple authentication, all driven by the IT security folks will make life simpler. And as Maureen started to touch on the dollars, you know, the dollars that are on the table where the duplication and redundancies are, are significant. So as you think about one card, one ID, multiple authentication, uh, you know, validation that, uh, that I am actually in the building because I had to use the card at the door before I get on the network, uh, from a physical space, and, and if you add in that, how many people are working at home today, are working at will today, you know, not even ever near an office. Um, I met one of our new employees uh, at ASIS International today. She'd been here two years, works in Sacramento out of her house, you know, 3,000 plus miles away from where our HQ is. And 10 years ago, you would have never allowed that. But technology has driven that. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the numbers, but there was a study done on commercial space that uh, one organization said if they could reduce their commercial space by 50% and you sp let people work at home, the dollars were just astronomical. So that's a long-winded answer to a short question. Thanks, Ray. So of course what we're hearing here is a, a, a theme of business relevance and uh, being a, a savvy business person as well as a security practitioner and of course these are important concepts as the different parts of the industry come together and we collaborate, uh, we learn, we share and we get better at what we do in terms of having an integrated response and of course without necessarily having to change the whole organisational infrastructure. Hort, I'd invite you to perhaps make some comments about that. Have you got some thoughts from ISC Squared's perspective? I was just uh, sharing with, with Ray an email I got this morning that, that shows how great minds all think together. Um, the state of Michigan just announced that they have merged physical security with IT, with the, with the logical site, and they're having it report through their chief technology officer. But the underlying text of the, of the article that made that interesting was the real interest in efficiency as we're talking about, but also in being more effective on protecting critical infrastructure. So they, they're calling the office CIP, Critical Infrastructure uh, Protection, on that. And as I think about all of the, of the things that we have exposed from, uh, from all of the, the, the very high profile critical infrastructure that we're all responsible for managing in one way or the other, we gotta do it together. You can't, we, we can't go in undivided and uh, without our act together, I think is the best way to, to uh, put it bluntly, uh, any more in the future. I mean, there's too much at risk. So things like this, good ideas need to be moved forward. And I was, I was pleased to see that article. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Uh, how about other questions, thoughts, comments from our friends and colleagues from the media on the floor. Over here, please, ma'am. Okay, so the question was about what are the what are the barriers that we see to collaboration between these different fields? Maureen. Uh, one of the first barriers is, is uh, when you have um, uh, two separate departments, people think that instead of combining the uh, departments that you're going to eliminate jobs. So that would be the first and biggest barrier because why would I work with them because they are the people that could potentially take my job. And as leaders in the security organization, um, we have to show that it's putting two, to two, two and two together to make five, not two and two together so we could have three. And that becomes very, very important because in, especially in jobs and, and uh, around the world with this economy, people are always thinking it's cost saving, not um, increasing the security or reducing the risk for a corporation. 
uh, and that would be one of the big barriers. The other is, is um, frankly, people are afraid that they can't learn the other field. And, you know, one would think with the credentials of IT folks and the engineering degrees that they were there, that they would be able to quickly adapt um, or that the, that the physical security folks um, typically wouldn't. What I've found is the physical security folks, um, and, and this isn't a, you know, a generality, but the physical security folks are willing to learn the IT because if you go onto the floor of our seminar right now, everything has an IP address. They are working in the IT world, uh, though they may not even call it there. The, what I find is my IT folks are sometimes reluctant to realize that they have to work um, uh, very closely with the human element. Because when you put um, a bit and a byte together and you have positives and negatives, every time you get the same result, every single time. But when you have a human is the cause of the issue, you never have the same result. And that for some folks, the two-legged uh, cause of the incident sometimes becomes very hard to deal with. And so what it is, is working and training the people in the areas they need development. So with the IT folks, um, you have to have a, a comprehensive training program on how to work with the interviewing and interrogation and so that those folks are comfortable in that space. Or if you have someone who's better served uh, in, in working just with machines, allow them to continue to work with machines. But maybe some of their machines may be CCTV cameras and access control and not servers and databases. So you have to be a, a savvy leader uh, is probably one of the, the main things. And then on the physical security side is to provide the training because it is pretty daunting when you bring in a database engineer and security and they start talking about uh, you know, Oracle or they talk about SQL or DB2. Oh my God, how could you ever learn that language? And what you have to do is bring it as a leader, bring it in to the concepts of security. A door access control sounds a lot like a port in a firewall. What's a firewall? Firewall is nothing more than that physical wall. It just happens to be in the cyberspace. And you bring in security as the concepts, and people understand it, and then the barriers come down. Thanks very much, Maureen. I couldn't help think as you were drawing those parallels and just reinforcing the, uh, the sensibility of having a common language just how right you really are. Access control is access control, be it in a physical sense or in a cyber sense. I've got to tell you, it's been a real pleasure working with uh, many of the capable CISSPs and CPPs together. Our organisations have worked very closely through the course of this year to produce multiple white papers, one of which, in fact, uh, is an introduction to cloud computing for the physical security professional. So there's a lot of investment going on. There are leaders in both of our organisations learning this new language, assimilating, beginning to understand how it all pulls together and that we have got a common uh, language. And events like this with the ISC Squared Inaugural Congress, co-located with the ASIS 57th Annual Seminar and Exhibits, is a terrific occasion to be able to not just celebrate that, but to actually take that the next step. And we're seeing that, of course, with uh, something like 180 uh, odd papers here. We're seeing that with uh, uh, a showroom and an exhibits with literally hundreds of uh, exhibitors talking those sorts of languages and learning from each other. Ray, have you got some comments around um, the idea of the common, the common language of business, the common language of the InfoSec and the physical security professional? Well, this is a challenge that, uh, that faces both sides of the organization. And uh, today, the dollars that, uh, that corporations have set aside for capital spending and other spending has to be justified by a business case. So it might be terrific for me to say, we need, you know, we've got to rip out this access control system because it doesn't really meet our needs and we can't go global with it. But I would need to partner with my colleagues here, Maureen, and say, Maureen, we've got to figure out a way to do this together with software because we can't get those dollars today. 
So that security practitioner, whether they be on the cyber side or the physical side, really has to be more versed in business skills and be able to go in front of the C-suite with a business case that fights for those dollars along with the same person from facilities or engineering that wants a new machine or a new production plant or something like that. So collaborating together from a technology and, and standardization standpoint and going after those dollars and making sure they're the right dollars that are spent with the right return on investments that drive efficiency around the world are something that, uh, that we really shouldn't be doing ourselves anymore because it's not efficient. Thanks, Ray. And so just before we uh, begin to close this up, I'd like to invite uh, Horde just to give us uh, the ISC squared perspective on that. I especially uh, appreciated the, uh, the comments on the, uh, on the reasoning on bringing this together and the difficulties. I think we've all experienced that um, change. The fear of change is, is uh, always underestimated. Um, and, and loss of control is, uh, is another thing that I've always had to fight in trying to modernize and, and, do, uh, and to do things differently. And you just have to keep, uh, keep plugging away at it. But we have to keep in mind that uh, uh, some interesting statistics that uh, I recently saw was from 2009, the United States made 18% gain, a little over 18% gain in productivity. And how did they do that? They did, they did through gains in technology. Companies are sitting on lots of money. They have made lots of money by uh, hitching up their, uh, their efficiency belt, I guess, for lack of a better word on that, and, and making, making that work. Um, 2010, we got another 3.5%. And, you know, it's led, it's led to some joblessness, and that's what was referred to. And yet you have to think ahead uh, while being efficient it's more than just saving money in a lot of cases. It's preserving the, uh, the long-term future and the nature of your workforce in the training. And what we're seeing a lot in our business now is since we have a very lucrative field, uh, people who have maybe a little bit of knowledge in our area want to get into the area, and it may work for your, your areas as well. Uh, because liberal arts degrees are not putting people in jobs now, and we have to admit a lot of these joblessness issues have come as a result of our efficiency and these 18 and 20 percent uh, productivity gains. So we have a responsibility, I think, uh, as, uh, as nonprofit organizations to, uh, to look and try to, to uh, tailor our programs to try to accommodate as many people as we can. And we're doing that with, with, uh, with IC Squared. We're working with organizations and schools and companies to the extent that we have resources and, and power to do that, to do that moving forward. But uh, with this, now we can do it with a, uh, with a full scope of a full picture of the total security package. And it makes us feel good. Thank you. Thanks, Lord. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've heard from our expert panelists today. We've touched on several very interesting <coughs> topics. Uh, the language of uh, business, the need for a common, common language, not just for business, but of course for the different aspects of security, whether it be logical or, or physical, how there's a willingness to work together, and of course the fact that we've got mutual recognition that we're partners in the same security ecosystem, and that sure we've got challenges, but challenges that are to be overcome, and that's the value of a strong partnership. So I'd certainly like to uh, express the appreciation, firstly to our panellists, to uh, Ray O'Hara, President of ASIS International, to Maureen Allison, uh, the Board of Directors of ASIS International, and to Hord Tipton from Executive Director of ISC Squared. And last but certainly not least to you, uh, the media, and the folks who are getting the message out there on this very important topic. Thank you very much.